who, from being the loved one of the Father, never misjudged, never unappreciated, and receiving the ceaseless adoration of all the hierarchies of heaven, became a despised Nazarene, misunderstood by his most faithful followers, neglected and rejected by men who owed him their very being and whose salvation he had come to seek, and finally mocked, spit upon, crucified, and slain with thieves and outlaws. Will any follower of Christ, reflecting on these things, hesitate to make the trifling sacrifices indicated above? It was a sacrifice, and no one knew it better than Maria Taylor. She wrote her friend, Mrs. Berger, Things which are tolerated in us as foreigners, wearing foreign dress, could not be allowed for a moment in native ladies. I do not at all mean to imply a, a doubt as to the desirability of the change, but the nearer we come to the Chinese in outward appearance, the more severely will any breach of propriety, according to their standards, be criticized. Henceforth, I must never be guilty, for example, of taking my husband's arm out of doors. And in fifty or a hundred other ways, we may, without great watchfulness, shock the Chinese by what would seem to them grossly immodest and unfeminine conduct. Oh, pray much for us in respect to this matter. Maria Taylor, too, had a cross-cultural sensitivity far ahead of her time. Just three weeks after their arrival in Shanghai, the entire party boarded houseboats to travel together into the interior, heading up the Grand Canal toward Hangzhou in search of a permanent inland headquarters for the mission. Traveling by houseboats made it possible for the women and children to be sheltered from curious crowds as they passed city after city. Everywhere they stopped, Hudson inquired about permission to rent or buy accommodations where some of the young men in his party might settle. But at each stop, he was refused permission from local authorities. No suitable place was available. The landlord wouldn't come to terms, or some other complication thwarted his original plan. So, the full contingent of missionaries, some twenty strong, remained together as the boats finally approached the great city of Hangzhou. The tailors knew that two or three mission families had already taken up residence in that city, and it would mean serious risk to them as well as to the new arrivals if such a large party of foreigners stirred up opposition. But what else could they do? It was autumn. Winter was fast approaching. The nights on the water was already bitterly cold, and several of the party were ill, and the boat people were clamoring to go home for the winter. Never had the responsibilities of leadership weighed so heavily on him as it did when Hudson left the boats in a quiet place outside the city and went ahead to inquire about the accommodation they so desperately needed. Maria also felt the seriousness of the situation. So, after Hudson left, she gathered the younger missionaries for prayer, telling them of the comfort that had come to her through the psalm in her regular reading that morning. Quote, Who will bring me into this strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Wilt not thou, O God, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man? End quote. Together they read that passage again as they waited anxiously for word. Suddenly <clears throat> Hudson was back. Wonderful news! A home was ready, waiting for them. One of the Hangzhou missionaries was absent for a week and had left word that his house, comfortably furnished, was at the disposal of Mr. Taylor's party. Situated on a quiet street, it could be reached in the boats unobserved, and that very night the weariful, thankful travelers were at rest in the great city. Within the next few days, in spite of all the usual difficulties, Hudson secured premises of his own, a large rambling house which had once belonged to a government official that had over time become a warren, occupied by a number of families. There was plenty of room to adapt to the needs of the mission party, a number of renters and their families stayed on for a while, making it possible for the group to begin missionary work within their own doors, without attracting too much attention. From the very start, Jenny Faudling, the youngest of the party, was already able to make herself understood by the Chinese women. Hudson wrote in a report to his friends and supporters back in England at the 1st of December, It is pretty cold weather to be living in a house without any ceilings, and with very few walls and windows. There is a deficiency in the wall of my own bedroom, six feet by nine, closed in with a sheet so that ventilation is decidedly free. But we heed these things very little. Around us are poor, heathen, large cities without any missionary, populous towns without any missionary, 
villages without number, all destitute of the means of grace. I do not envy the state of mind that would forget these or leave them to perish for fear of a little discomfort. By mid-December, Jenny Falding wrote home, We have been getting the house a little more comfortable, though there is plenty still to be done. Mr. Taylor and the young men have contrived paper ceilings fixed on wooden frames, which keep out some of the cold air. For the upstairs rooms have roofs, such as you find in chapels at home. They also have prepared some of the partitions between the rooms. Of course, we are as yet in confusion, but we're getting on, and I hope shall be settled some day. The lodgers are to leave next week. They occupy principally the ground floor. I'm so glad for them to have been here, for many have come to Chinese prayer meetings and listen, listened attentively. We could not have visited out of doors yet, but I read and talk with those women every day, and they seem to like it. One woman I have great hope for. Before Christmas, they were interested audiences of 50 or 60 at the Sunday services, and Hudson had been at least on one evangelistic journey. In the neighboring city of Ziozhan, he and James Meadows had found excellent opportunities for preaching the gospel and had been able to rent a small house. They planned to settle some of the new arrivals there just as soon as possible. Right away, Hudson wrote Mr. Berger at the home office. You will be glad to learn that facilities for sending letters by native post and for transmitting money to the interior are very good. I do not think that there will be any difficulty in remitting money to any providence in the empire which will not be easily overcome. In the same way, letters from the, the most distant parts can be sent to the ports. Such communication is slow and may prove rather expensive, but it is tolerably sure. Thus we see the way opening before us for work in the interior. <clears throat> the team had barely established its first base in the interior and Hudson was already planning the next steps of sending missionaries farther inland. But in the meantime, his hands were more than full at Hengzhou. After the Chinese New Year, patients crowded into the dispensary, as many as 200 a day, and an equal number attended the Sunday services. When the first reinforcements arrived from home early in 1867, Hudson was literally too busy to even greet them until hours later. He was standing on a table at the time, preaching to a crowd of patients in the courtyard, and could only call out a hearty welcome as the newest party entered escorted by James Meadows. The busyness didn't seem to bother the new arrivals. They were more than happy to work side by side with the leader they so respected. John McCarthy, who became Hudson's chief medical assistant, later wrote of this time, I think of him as I ever knew him, kind, loving, thoughtful of everyone but himself, a blessing wherever he went, and a strength and comfort to all with whom he came in contact a constant example of all that a missionary ought to be. Yet there was some dissension in the ranks. One critical couple of the Chinese dress policy stirred up complaints about Hudson's leadership from two or three others as well. But Hudson and Maria, too, determined to respond with patience and love. Though the handful of dissenters sent their complaints about the Taylor's leadership back to England, neither Hudson nor Maria felt it necessary to defend themselves. Not until months later did Maria mention the matter, even in writing Mrs. Berger, and then it was an answer to inquiries from St. Hill that she even wrote at length. Do pray for us very much, for we do so need God's preserving grace at this present time. We've come to fight Satan in his very strongholds, and he will not let us alone. What folly were ours! Were we here in our own strength? But greater is he that is in us than all that are against us. I should be very sorry to see discord sown among the sisters of our party, and this is one of the evils I am fearing now. What turn the in, and then she underlines it so that uh, we won't uh, really know the name, what turn the in matter will take, I cannot think. One thing I know, the hope of Israel will not forsake us. One is almost tempted to ask, why was in permitted to come out? Perhaps it was that our mission might be thoroughly established on a right basis early in its history. Hudson and Maria were both deeply saddened by the conflict within the mission, yet the response in Hung Zhao continued to be very encouraging. So when the first baptisms came in May, Mrs. Taylor wrote again to Mrs. Berger, Perhaps the dear Lord sees that we need sorrows to keep us from being elated at the rich blessing he's giving in our work. By that time, the mission had established additional outposts and the administrative details had multiplied. 
As Jenny Falding wrote, If only Mr. Taylor could be in three or four places at the same time, it would be a decided advantage. He's wanting to visit the governing cities of the province, to look out for the most eligible places for stations. He and Mr. Duncan have been on the point of starting several times. Then there is Ningpo, where he is needed, and here he is overwhelmed with work. He wants to go to Zhao Hin, to Mr. Stevens' stations, that he may give further help with the colloquial dialect. There is hardly any knowing what his movements may be. Yet he goes on so quietly and calmly always, just leaning upon God and living for others. That is a blessing merely to witness his life. The greatest sacrifice he had to make, Hudson felt, was leaving his family behind whenever he had to depart on the journey. He loved his children and enjoyed all the time he could spend with them, including the daughter who was born that first winter in Hangzhou. But his little eight-year-old daughter, Grace, seemed a particular blessing. During the voyage to China on the Lamumur, she was so impressed by the changes she saw in the sailors who accepted Christ that she made her own personal commitment to the Lord. After that, despite her tender age, she seemed as devoted to the task in China as her parents. Early in 1867, she sent a note along with her father when he left on a short journey. Written on pink note paper with a flower painted in one corner were the words, Dear Papa, I hope God has helped you to do what you wanted and that you will soon come back. I have a nice bed mat for you when you come home, dear, dear Papa. As the summer malaria season set in and temperatures rose to 103 degrees Fahrenheit indoors, Hudson took Maria, who was getting sick, and his five children out to Hangzhou to some nearby wooded hills where they rented a cooler summer shelter in the ruins of an old temple. As they left their boats that first day and walked up the hill toward the temple, little Grace noticed a man making an idol. Oh, Papa, she said earnestly, he doesn't know about Jesus or he would never do that. Won't you tell him? His daughter's hand clasped in his, Hudson did so. Afterwards they walked on, and when they stopped to rest, Gracie wanted to pray for the man that they had met. Hudson wrote, Never have I heard such a prayer. She had seen the man making an idol. Her heart was full, and she was talking to God on his behalf. The dear child went on and on, pleading that God would have mercy upon the poor Chinese and would strengthen her father to preach to them. I never was so moved by any prayer. My heart was bowed before God. Words fail me to describe it. Just a week later, a broken-hearted Hudson Taylor wrote to his friend, Mr. Berger, Beloved brother, I know not how to write or how to refrain. I'm trying to pin a few lines by the couch on which my darling little Gracie lies dying. Her complaint is hydrocephalus. It was no vain nor unintelligent act when knowing this land, its people, and climate, I laid my wife and children with myself on the altar for this service. And he, whom so unworthily, yet in simplicity and godly sincerity, we are, and have been seeking to serve, and with some measure of success, he has not left us now. But to his mother, Hudson poured out his anguish. Our Dear little Gracie, how we miss her sweet voice in the morning, one of the first sounds to greet us when we awoke, and through the day, and at eventide. As I take the walks I used to take with her tripping figure at my side, the thought comes anew like a throb of agony. Is it possible that I shall never more feel the pressure of that little hand, never more see the sparkle of those bright eyes? And yet she's not lost. I would not have her back again. I'm thankful she was taken rather than any of the others. Though she was the sunshine of our lives, but she is far holier, far happier than she could have ever been here. I think I never saw anything so perfect, so beautiful as the remains of that dear child, the long silken eyelashes under the finely arched brows, the nose so delicately chiseled, the mouth small and sweetly expressive, the purity of the white feature. All are deeply impressed on heart and memory. And then her sweet little Chinese jacket and the little hands folded on her bosom holding a single flower. Oh, it was passing fair and so hard to close forever from our sight. Pray for us. At times I seem almost overwhelmed. But he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. So be it.